And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I would like to welcome all of you to this webinar. Uh, my name is Marion Tortera, and I'm the legal coordinator at the International Council of uh, Museums, ICOM. Today's event is a result of a fruitful collaboration between the International Council of Archives, ICA, the International Federation of Library Association and Institutions, IFLA and ICOM, and we are thrilled to come together to discuss uh, the new WIPO toolkit on preservation. As you know, preservation is at the heart of our work because libraries, archives, and museums have a public interest mission to safeguard our culti cultive, um, collective sorry, memory to preserving our cultural heritage. However, in the face of threat from natural or human-made disaster, as well as technological obsolescence, Preserving this heritage has never been so difficult and so crucial. Through copyrights, the Standing Committee on Copyrights and Related Rights, SCCR of the World Intellectual Property Organization, WAPO, have been addressing those issues, notably on this discussion regarding limitation and exception to copyrights for libraries, archives, and museums. So this toolkit is a result of nearly two years of work from experts and a consultation process with representatives for cultural institutions, Creative Economy and WIPO member states at the SCCR meeting. It, has, it was officially published in April 2024 and aims to provide a new resource for lawmakers and policymakers to consider all relevant issues in relation to preservation scoping. Before giving the floor to my colleague, I'm going to record the agenda of today's events. So first, we will have a presentation of the toolkit by the three experts, Rina Pantaloni, Kenex Cruz, and David Sutton. Uh, this representation will provide you insight into the copyrights content. And following the presentation, we will open the floor to a Q&A session. This will be your opportunity to engage directly with the experts, ask questions, and share your perspective. And I believe that preservation is a collective effort and it, it's through collaborate, collaboration and dialogue that we can achieve the best results. So I encourage you all to interact during the Q&A session. So now I will give the floor to uh, Jean Dridden from ICA. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I, I think we're having some technical difficulties getting Jean in the room. So in the meantime, um, my name is Sarah Benson and I represent IFLA. Um, I, I'm their delegate to WIPO. Um, I really wanted to thank all of our speakers for being here. Um, Kenneth Cruz is, is here via video. Um, oh, here comes Jean. I think I see her popping up. So thank you, Jean. I just wanted to let everyone know I'll be moderating the Q&A um at the end of the session so if you have questions as we go please just put them into the question um it says q a below and uh we'll get to them at the end uh over to jean uh thank you and i'm sorry for the uh, anxiety about uh, connecting anyway i'm here and um it's uh i'm i'm jean dryden i represent the international council on archives at wipo and it's a great pleasure to introduce the authors of the preservation toolkit who are our speakers today uh dr david sutton is an archivist a literary scholar and specialist in literary manuscripts a copyright researcher and a writer on international aspects of copyright law he's currently responsible for a number of research projects in the university of reading library formerly president of the Section for Literary Archives of the International Ar Council on Archives, his work focuses on the development of literary archives, especially in the Caribbean region and in Eastern and Southern Africa. Our second speaker will be Rina Pantaloni, who is a copyright lawyer and the director of the Copyright Advisory Services at Columbia University Libraries in New York City. She holds vast experience in working with cultural heritage organizations in Canada and the United States on matters concerning the digital reproduction and distribution of collections and related materials. She also serves as technical expert on cultural heritage matters to WIPO. Before joining Columbia, she was the legal counsel to Library and Archives Canada. She is a past chair of ICOM's Legal Affairs Committee and is widely published as an expert on intellectual property issues for libraries, archives, and museums. And our final speaker, who will um, appear by video, 
is Dr. Kenneth Cruz. He also wears many hats. He's an attorney, author, law professor, and international intellectual property consultant, particularly noted for his expertise regarding educational and library exceptions um, in copyright law. He established and directed America's first university-based copyright office at Indiana University, and for many years has been a consultant to WIPO. And he's the author of a, an excellent study on copyright limitations and exceptions for libraries and archives around the world. He's a frequent speaker and consultant on library-related copyright matters and the author of numerous publications. So just a reminder, if you do have questions, please put them in the um, uh, chat, uh, I, the, I guess the chat um, space, and Sarah will be moderating um, the question uh, period after all the speakers have uh, made their presentations. So I'll now turn it over to David Sutton to start us off. I hope that my um, screen sharing is working uh, properly. It looks okay to me. Um, Thank you for the introductory words from Marianne and Jean. It's a great pleasure to be here, and it's particularly appropriate that um, IFLA and ICOM and ICA should be working together in uh, having prepared this, uh, this webinar, because we, the three authors of this toolkit, uh, were also chosen to represent the three professions working together, libraries, archives, and museums. My role was to um, represent archives within the work of the toolkit and probably also to do to be something of a generalist um, in the company of two copyright specialists from whom you'll hear more uh, shortly. The, the idea of the, uh, of the toolkit is that it should provide a combination of explanatory text, background text, reasoned uh, context as to why certain matters need to be discussed and reviewed, and at the same time, some very practical um, guidance and options for creators of legislation in, in order that they can um, either revise or work from, uh, from the start on drafting copyright legislation, particularly in respect of limitations and exceptions um, for libraries, archives, and museums. The first thing I want to stress is that there was a lot of background that went into um, the decision to, to work on this toolkit. And it goes right the way back to uh, just before the pandemic in uh, 2019, when there was a full discussion at an SCCR session on how to move forward on limitations and exceptions in the area of cultural heritage. And then there were three regional seminars held in Singapore, Nairobi and Santo Domingo. And in those seminars, I think it's reasonable to say that there was a very good level of consensus. There was um, all the stakeholders who typically um, meet at WIPO were rep well represented in these uh, regional seminars. And we were able to understand the points of view of people coming from different perspectives and also to identify what were going to be the key issues that needed to be covered in respect of limitations and exceptions for libraries, archives and museums. And the key topics are identified in this slide as being preservation, copying, and then access, access to heritage materials and the possibilities for limitations and exceptions there. And in particular, also the importance of cross-border working. The whole, the whole point of doing this work is the attempt to, to bring some sort of um, ability to rationalize the different legislation that, under which we all work. So preservation copying, issues to do with access and issues to do with cross-border working were a key part of these, uh, these seminars. Then we were hit by the pandemic 
and uh, the work went into abeyance for a period of time. When we were able to resume our meetings, there were a number of factors then in play. We were, we were keen to go back to the level of uh, consensus and good work and good thinking that had characterized the 2019 meetings. Obviously, WIPO had expended a lot of energy and also considerable amounts of money in pulling together the 2019 meetings. And they, as well as we, very much wanted to see definite outcomes from the level of good quality discussion and consensus that had been achieved in the 2019 meetings. So the view was that we should proceed step by step. We shouldn't try to do all of the topics that I referred to. We shouldn't try to bundle together preservation, copying and access and cross-border working, but we should try to do something finite and something that could be presented within a reasonable period of time. And it, it appeared to everybody, I think, that preservation copying, limitations and exceptions in the area of preservation was the best place to start. And the reason for that was that it would seem to be the area where there was the least controversy between people representing the rights holders and people who had a particular interest in making cultural heritage collections open and available. And there was a consensus also that a toolkit could be a better way of doing this, a more consensual and acceptable way of doing this perhaps than a sort of instrument uh, on limitations and exceptions, which had proved, which idea had proved contentious in previous WIPO meetings. So we felt that making a start was very important. We felt that preservation copying was the obvious area with which to make a start because of levels of, of consensus and we made a start. And we wanted to sustain uh, the consensus that had uh, characterized the 2019 meetings. And so uh, towards the end of 2022, a meeting was held in Geneva at which all the different stakeholders were represented. And again, it was focused on preservation, copying, exceptions and limitations. And that, that, that meeting over, I think, three days went exceptionally well. And there, was, there were good levels of agreement and also understanding between the different stakeholders as to a good way forward. So the toolkit, um, its structure, was, uh, as I've said, was to start off with introductory material and explanatory material, and then to move on to practical examples and suggestions. So the idea was that the toolkit would um, describe and explain what preservation programs were for, how they worked. We were fortunate in that there were best practice uh, examples available to us uh, to use and to use as examples. Um, we, uh, we addressed the issue, and I'm sure this will come up later, uh, of uh, the way to choose uh, statutory language. Uh, we stressed the urgency uh, of preservation copying in, in areas, in a wide range of uh, areas, where heritage might be at risk. And we, while we did, in, and we do in the toolkit, refer quite a bit to extreme traumatic events, such as war and disasters and so on, we also wanted to stress that the need for preservation copying was there in, um, in everyday circumstances, everyday concerns, the simple passage of time uh, and, and so on. So, as the text of the toolkit says, our intention in uh, drafting the toolkit was to provide a wide range of individuals with guidance and assistance and suggestions. So, it, it's aimed perhaps primarily at people who are involved in drafting legislation, but also the, we, we definitely see uh, an audience in heritage professionals such as the attendees at this webinar. And the idea is to pre present options, possibilities, examples of best practice and ways to move forward to reconcile the duty of care with the rights and the interests of copyright owners and to, and to 
maintain that balance, which is uh, vital to the smooth working and also vital to passage through WIPO. And one of the issues that we'll return to later, and this is my, my final point by way of introduction, is that we are very aware that preservation copying and facilitating preservation copying through limitations and exceptions was an important part of future-proofing collections. And what this means in practical terms is that one does not wait for collections to deteriorate and be in a, a dangerously damaged, vulnerable state. Preservation must be anticipatory. Heritage professionals must have the opportunity to identify um, collections and individual items which are likely to be at risk in the future and to be able to take action uh, on, in those cases. And that was an important part of the thinking that went into, the, um, into this first toolkit. I'll, I'll end my introductory remarks at that stage, and I'm pleased that I did so by referring to this as the first toolkit. We learnt a lot in preparing this toolkit on preservation, and we will be moving on to other toolkits. But for today, our subject is the, um, is the preservation toolkit, and I'm now ready to hand over to Rena, who's going to continue with some more um, practical um, guidance about what the toolkit does. I'm gonna end screen share. Thank you, David. Stop share. Okay. Over to you, Rena. Thanks so much, David. I, I'm just going to share my screen so that you can all see my slides. There we go. And I'm going to keep it in this mode so that um, you, so that I can see all of you <laughs> as as I'm speaking. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm picking up where David left off on the toolkit uh, and to talk about what now uh, is actually in the toolkit itself. And in fact, why uh, we included certain uh, subject matter in the toolkit itself. Um, so first of all, um, so that you, you get a little more context for some of my comments, uh, before uh, I was asked by WIPO to uh, help prepare uh, the toolkit on preservation and draft it, um, I spent a, a number of years representing ICOM uh, before WIPO on issues concerning uh, exceptions to copyright for libraries, archives, and museums. And it, it struck me as it, it struck um, the then representative of IFLA, Winston Tab, um, that the, the people in the room that were decision makers, um, the copyright policy, uh, experts, the representatives of member states, the intellectual property experts really didn't know what we did for a living from a day-to-day -day perspective um, in uh, libraries, archives, museums, cultural heritage institutions, in how we work with collections. When we, we use the term preservation, and preservation means a lot to us, but in fact, the lawmakers themselves did not understand what we meant by preservation from, from a, a context, contextual perspective and from a detailed perspective. And so there is a part of this toolkit that attempts to define what preservation means in a contemporary context and that we we mean uh, certain activities that require uh, the uh, reproduction and distribution of objects and materials in various different formats. And that we also need to care for and uh, preserve those materials and objects that are born digital. And in providing at least a foundational definition of what constitutes preservation activity, it was felt from there we could start to make suggestions, provide considerations to policymakers uh, how to construct 
exceptions to copyright for this purpose. So you can see on my first screen here, uh, we talk about conservation and stabilization, the need to document object-based collections, which is very much part of a, 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 the management of an object-based collection, regardless of institution, whether library, archive, museum, historic uh, society or organization. And then we also go on, as David mentioned, we do talk about some of the extreme, the extreme events, but they're worth noting, particularly since uh, we have been experiencing these events at an accelerated pace over the course of, let's say, the last 10 years, including the pandemic, which uh, was uh, also uh, a preservation, uh, for a, a disaster of sorts, uh, because we could not access the collections to preserve them if our institutions were in fact closed. And, and so um, the, the need to actually state in a preservation toolkit from an intellectual, intellectual property standpoint, um, what we are experiencing as uh, a cultural heritage community was in fact seen as absolutely critical so that uh, exceptions to copyright, if uh, taken up and then drafted in various jurisdictions would be very forward thinking um, in their in their application. And this notion, as David mentioned, of anticipatory preservation, this idea of future proofing um, is absolutely critical because we are starting to see events accelerate um, that uh, in fact completely destroy collections through fire, flood, and unfortunately as well through human conflict. It is important to mention here as well that within the legal context, our institutions hold a legal duty of care to preserve. This is a very foundational legal obligation that we in fact are responsible for when we work in uh, uh, the, the institutions um, that we are associated with. Um, it's also an ethical requirement and um, that when copyright or other forms of intellectual property um, create barriers uh, against which we run up when we are carrying out our uh, preservation activities, we are in fact experiencing a conflict between our legal duty of care to preserve and the copyright laws. And for this reason, some resolution from a legal perspective is in fact necessary to ensure that we can uh, preserve uh, collections so that they can be uh, eventually accessed um, in the future, uh, regardless of the kinds of events we're experiencing um, uh, on an accelerated uh, in pathway forward. Um, this idea of the trusted institution became very important. The idea that um, those institutions who are entrusted with a legal duty of care to preserve for the public, for the benefit of the public, should be viewed, in fact, quite differently and distinctly. And that um, the conflict between the legal duty of care and copyright law uh, really needs to be resolved for this purpose. So as David mentioned already, we look at proactive preservation as a necessary element that you uh, make reproductions of objects and materials in their best state and that you don't, that you're not obligated to wait until deterioration takes place or ironically, sometimes we've seen in certain jurisdictions, there, there is this provision that says, you know, if the, if the object or materials are lost, you can make a copy. Um, if they're rare materials, that opportunity will have been lost when your object or materials were lost. 
policy considerations uh, as well, the, that the future is digital, that in fact, preservation activities are in and of themselves potentially cross-border activities, and that uh, we are dealing both with foreign digital and digitization uh, as part of uh, our activity. We also uh, recommend and suggest the importance of rights metadata. It's not only designed to support respectful and lawful subsequent uses of uh, digitized material and digital material um, as uh, they can be um, accessed, but in fact, as they can be preserved as well. And it's in fact recording the provenance of objects and materials in a collection in the online environment. And it, it provides cultural heritage uh, uh, institutions and the community uh, a place in the discussion, the ongoing discussion about rights terminology and uh, what it means when, for example, materials and objects are found in the digital realm in the online environment and what can and cannot be done with them uh, once they have been accessed. We also wanted to impress upon lawmakers the need to consider a broad range of cultural heritage organizations because as we were advocating early on, um, co collections themselves may be held uh, in institutions that may not have the, the term library, archive, or museum on their front door. There, there may be um, circumstances where, uh, for example, academic institutions um, hold archival collections, but they may not necessarily be held in an archive. Should they be penalized for this purpose? And so the need to really put preservation of collections front and center um, uh, and the purpose for which the collection is being preserved and the audience for whom the, 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 the benefit is derived uh, and the purpose of use being front and center as well, as opposed to just the name on the front door of an institution. We also flagged the complexity in how we now own and share and manage collections. Um, the, the notion of split collections and archives is a well-known well notion. The fact that you could have an archival collection of correspondence in one institution, and then the, the responding uh, correspondence sitting in an archive of another. Um, the fact that uh, we are seeing more and more uh, collections owned jointly among distinct organizations. Uh, this has been the at least one experience that I've had most recently where a museum jointly owns a collection with uh, uh, my home institution, Columbia University Libraries, and uh, what that means uh, when we preserve uh, the collection. Uh, organizations can be, as I just mentioned, interdisciplinary. And that also means that we work across borders. We have to work where the collections reside. And if you take the example I just uh, provided earlier of the archival correspondence, where uh, these collections reside are not based on what the legal jurisdiction is. It's based on how the collections uh, evolved over time and how those who created the collections evolved in their work um, over time. There are also cooperative preservation programs that we wanted to flag to lawmakers as a policy consideration. 
So that even if collections are not owned jointly or they're not split effectively, like the archival uh, example I gave just now, um, the, the need to be able to cooperate, particularly across borders, as we engage in preservation activity is becoming paramount. And it could be engagement from a substantive technical standpoint, or it could be that, for example, a museum owns the work of a particular artist and a companion piece is owned by another and a comparative analysis needs to take place um, from a preservation standpoint. This is particularly also important uh, where uh, there are companion collections across borders um, so that from a research perspective, if materials sit in one collection, very fundamental uh, research can be copied from one archive to another so that researchers in another uh, center that may not have the kind of uh, remote access to collections necessary to complete their research can still access this fundamental knowledge um, to complete their own work. And so I'm going to segue into now uh, Kenny Cruz domain um, so that we can join uh, the, the presentation that I just gave on some of the detailed considerations when creating these exceptions. Kenny's video will be talking a lot about the detailed considerations when drafting. And uh, he, uh, what we did rather in, in the toolkit is that we gave added uh, voice to these kinds of issues, such as uh, the idea of adding a purpose statement to contextualize the overall provision, or uh, more importantly, to contextualize the legislation itself, um, uh, where the legislation addresses the preservation of uh, cultural heritage collections. Um, the need for technological and format neutrality um, to ensure the long-term um, health of a preservation provision. Um, as we all know, technology is working at uh, and, and evolving at rapid, rapid rates. And if a pr provision is drafted in such a way that confines uh, what can be done to preserve to a certain snapshot in time, the provision will be outdated quite quickly. The, the need to consider the availability of proprietary pla platforms and software and how that impacts preservation. So for example, if a, a digital, a, a workborn digital is captured by a particular uh, uh, software and uh, the software is proprietary, the only way to preserve is in fact to uh, replicate the proprietary platform. Uh, if, if that's the case, how do you manage that additional intellectual property interest um, from a preservation standpoint? And then uh, the, the experience that uh, at least we've had in the United States of, uh, in certain circumstances, limiting the number of copies that can be made. And we've certainly seen that in other jurisdictions as well. Um, what is the impact of, of doing that? Uh, you know, new, newly uh, evolving preservation uh, technologies and, and the, the practices um, may require multiple copies in different formats. Um, and uh, by limiting the number of formats uh, or number of copies rather, you're essentially limiting the number of formats. So at this point, uh, I think to complete our presentation, uh, we'd like to now turn it over to not Kenny Cruz Live, but <laughs> Kenny Cruz Video. And so uh, Sarah, Jean, if I'll stop sharing my slides and perhaps we can get um, Kenny's video going. And thank you, everyone.
I think you'll need to share sound there, Jean. Uh, Sarah. I'm having trouble sharing the sound. It's not allowing me to click the button. I don't know how to fix that. I'll have a go. That's fine. Okay. Yeah, I think we're having a slight moment on this one. I might suggest going on quickly as we've already got one question which you might want to take and we'll deal with the video in the meanwhile. All right, sounds great. Um, so I see the question is what will be the future of tangible heritage? As you know, the future is digital. David, do you wanna go first? Yeah, sure. It's true that the future is digital. Um, we're in all the work that we've done so far. We've stressed uh, multiple formats. There's a lot of um, very strong views in WIPO that we must um, take account of the digital future. But uh, in in drafting this toolkit and the next one, we've we've needed to emphasise that there are still countries in the world where access to digital copies. is limited uh, by uh, the absence of technological development to date. And if there are 200 countries in the world, what, we're, what we would probably say at the moment is that more than half of those countries can make copies available digitally um, as, as part of their normal processes. But that still means there are a lot of countries where that is not the case. And so we have to balance the um, the descriptions that we give and the advice that we give and really format neutrality as uh, Rena described is very very important um, in this that we we try in this toolkit and we will try in future toolkits to examine the implications of making copies available digitally because it's quite different from making copies available by photocopy uh, and so on it does it does mean a wider range of access becomes possible and it has implications which cause concern for rights holders. So it's um, a broad topic that has to uh, play an essential part in, uh, in toolkit writing. And we, we want to be sure that we cover all the aspects and that we provide some reassurances and perhaps some options in respect of making uh, available digital copies. But at this stage, I would also stress that we are writing for all of the 200 countries in the world and digital is not the main factor in all of those countries. I'll hand over to Rena. Thanks, David. Um, maybe the best way to answer this question is to actually use an example from uh, a, an experience in Brazil where the National Museum in Brazil lost their entire collection to fire. The, the, the truth is, you, from, from a preservation standpoint, um, reproduction is a standard practice in preserving both tangible uh, uh, cultural heritage, uh, those objects and materials that are tacked up, right? That, that we need to be able to make copies. But what we are suggesting is that uh, even if uh, the copies themselves are being made for preservation, uh, they're also very useful as a way of documenting the collection in the event that we lose the original. And, and so that uh, the backup uh, over time becomes the copies. And far be it for a copy to actually be a substitution for the original. 
Hardly so, but at least we have a record um, and it's part of the inventory uh, of what, what in fact was part of this collection should we lose the collection in the first instance. So tangible heritage is still front and center. Um, yes, we're dealing with uh, material born digital uh, on a regular basis now in certain jurisdictions and for some institutions, but we're talking about the ability to carry out the preservation of both tangible uh, cultural heritage and that cultural heritage in digital form. Thank you to you both. And I believe that I can play this video now. So let's see if we can hear from Kenneth while he is uh, on his video. Hang on. Hello and good day to all of you, wherever you may be located. My name is Kenny Cruz. I bet I've been in the room with many of you who are out there watching this right now. I've been dealing with the copyright issues of importance to libraries, museums, archives, and more institutions for a lot of years, including a lot of writing and a lot of workshops and many programs. I want to tell you too that it's a pleasure to be here because this marks kind of a turning point where we've all been with each other through the years addressing some of these copyright issues in the context of the work of WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization. And by the way, my thanks as we begin this to all our good friends and colleagues at WIPO, to Sarah and everybody at, at IFLA and the different organizations that are hosting this event today. I'm excited to see <clears throat> that it involves the participation of museums and many other groups, because indeed the discussion of libraries became quickly archives. It also became museums and it became many other cultural institutions and a little bit more about that too. Now, I know that this is the launch of the toolkit that you've all been waiting for and supporting very creatively and patiently, and I thank you very much for that. I'm going to do two basic things, and I hope it doesn't intrude on what others have done. I want to talk about the beginning, and I want to talk about the end. And the beginning is just a few words about putting this in context. We've now launched, or WIPO has launched, the toolkit on preservation of copyright protected works. Now think of that as an exception to the copyright, the rights of the copyright holder, because it's a, a concept in, in, in this case where we're looking at how to structure and how to draft better copyright exception statutes that can facilitate and advance the mission of our cultural institutions to preserve and to provide access to, we'll talk about that too, the, the, the materials in their collections that either have already incurred some kind of adverse event, a, a damage or other, other kind of event, or they are subject to it and, and they may deteriorate just as many of our artifacts and objects do simply while they're sitting on the shelf. So we're looking at the copyright exceptions for being able to make copies, use to some extent those copies in the context of copyrighted works for purpose of preservation and some related issues too, like conservation and, and so on. Back at the beginning, let's go there again. Uh, what I want to be sure we do is set this in the kind of chronological context of, of where this document, this preservation toolkit has come from. Uh, the, the WIPO member states, the basically nearly every country of the world, addresses different kinds of copyright issues in different ways and has responsibility for developing treaties and other documents and administering them uh, in the member state countries. The, the 
effort to try to develop copyright exceptions really began in earnest with a proposal from a handful of countries, principally some South American countries, to that suggesting that WIPO ought to step into this arena and should do so, and this was long about 2004 and 2005 when these initial proposals were being introduced in WIPO. This is a bit of a challenge for WIPO because WIPO had customarily been really focused more on securing rights and protecting the interests of creative people and rights holders. All good stuff, but another big part of copyright law is the set of limitations and exceptions, including exceptions for preservation. And so, so the in that context, WIPO then began to de, de, commission people, including me, to develop documents, papers, research, studies, and so on, on many of these issues. And that's where I came in. Whatever year this is, 2024, <clears throat> I began working on these issues for WIPO in the year 2007. And so it's been quite a few years. So whenever I hear anybody say, maybe it's too early to work on that, I remind them, you know, maybe it's too late. You know, we should be looking at this in another way. But so, and I think many of you listening know that we've been at this for a long time and you've been there with us as great support and we, we thank you. So, WIPO begins this process and they commissioned me and they commissioned others to do similar kind of studies to take a look at the status quo. What's what's already out there? What are countries already doing? And, and, and to sum it up in a sentence or two, what I was able to find was that there is considerable diversity in the way the statutes are drafted around the world, especially these so-called library archives, et cetera, exceptions, and especially for preservation. So there's considerable diversity in the details, but realistically what we're talking about is maybe half the countries of the world had, have at this point, a statute that in one fashion or another is a copyright exception supporting the preservation related activities of libraries, archives, and other types of cultural institutions. So based on that, WIPO began this long process and we all know that, that it just was up and down and up and down. At one point there was an extraordinarily, I think we all knew, highly ambitious treaty proposal. Um, and we took a lot of encouragement, frankly, from the Marrakesh Treaty that, that came out of this same WIPO effort. And it set forth details for exceptions to make copies and formats of works for persons who are blind or visually impaired. And that's where the Marrakesh Treaty came in. And we took inspiration from that, that, you know, this is all doable, this is possible. Well, that ambitious treaty became narrower and narrower and narrower. And then, of course, what happened, we can look back and see that, you know, politics, initiative, different people being replaced by as delegates to the meetings in Geneva, Switzerland, kind of the feeling of starting over again. Then came COVID and COVID put everything on hold as a practical matter for a long time. Just before COVID, a few of us were sent to different places in the world, to Nairobi, to, to, to Singapore, and to Dominican Republic to be able to address these issues locally and learn locally um, about what's needed, what's desirable, what will really work. So we're also very aware that this is a big project because there would be cultural, economic kind of diversity around the world where not everybody wants the same answer. We couldn't package it in a simple way. And then ultimately, step by step by step through that process, now we're talking 2019, 2020, 2021, moving toward we got to get something, we got to get a foothold here. And this is where WIPO turned its attention, as I understand they have in other parts of WIPO dealing with other issues, toward this notion of toolkit. You know, if we're not going to get a consensus about a major document like a treaty, how are we going to at least get some consensus around a resource 
that can flat out help countries think about the issues and draft statutes, better statutes, because in some cases they have no statutes. So let's see what we can do. And that's kind of the background leading up to this toolkit. I'm going to let others and let, heck, they can do it a lot better than I ever will. Uh, the others on this program to talk about the concepts of preservation, the significance, you know, how the experience we've had with it. I'm going to jump over that and go right now to really the last part of the toolkit. When you have the toolkit in hand, and you can go through it right now if you have it, you have the toolkit in hand, you can at this point be able to, to go to the end and see that we set up a framework that's based upon some pretty familiar, simple kind of repertorial points. Who, what, when, where, why? You know, who is it that's able to use this, this exception in the law? Is it libraries? Is it certain types of libraries? Is it archives? Is it certain types of archives? Is it museums? Same kind of question, and the list goes on. Is it not only certain types, but, you know, are they for-profit, non-profit? Who, who is in? Who's out? What kind of line can be drawn? And just starting with that, as you look at the toolkit and you go to those charts at the back, you will see that what we have attempted to do is from status quo statutes, as well as from other resources, critics and contributors writing about these issues, we have pulled together numerous possibilities for how to answer that question. For example, who, libraries, et cetera, who can use this statute? This is where a country would go to those charts and say, in our case, where the real need lies is with the these leading kind of research libraries. They're the only ones doing preservation. So maybe we're fine narrowing it to that. Another country is going to say, well, no, we're really dependent on the, or the, the system of public libraries. They're really the dominant players in all of this. So we want them to be able to be part of it. And somebody else is going to say, well, there's a lot of concern about the interruption with commercial uses, interruption of commercial uses, or we're concerned that they, these libraries may somehow make a, a profit and pocket some money out of uh, somehow out of the preservation program. You know, so fine. If you don't want that, then there's there are other kinds of language options that are provided in those charts to be able to say that the institution itself is nonprofit or that this particular preservation transaction is undertaken without any kind of profit or commercial money making motive so you can begin to see there are a lot of issues you know what what can be copied the next kind of issue and this is where, you know, those of us in this business know full well that there's probably, it's probably honest and accurate to say that every type of work is subject to needing preservation support one way or another. Every object. So whether it's a DVD, uh, whether it's a VHS film, whether it's a book, whether it's a manuscript, whether it's a family photo album, Whatever the work might be in the collection, it can easily be subject to needing preservation services, to needing, in particular in a copyright context, to be reproduced in, in the collections so that there is the, that copy, that reproduction, that backup that is in the collection. So who, what, when, where? within the institution, geographical bounds, and, and, and why? How do we define this? You know, one of the major subjects is the, the very simple but sweeping distinction between saying the works may be copied or the institution may make copies for preservation purposes, but only if the works in question are already 
experiencing loss, damage, deterioration, and so on. So that the work has to already be suffering some kind of fate that would merits reproduction to make sure we have a preservation copy. The other half of that line, the other side of that line, is is the the concept of of this preemptive effort to be able to say that we are going to have a preservate we're going to allow preservation copies in order to make sure that the copy exists in the event of that particular loss of that particular work and so so moving in that direction clearly is going to serve the interests of preservation and the in the mission of the cultural institution and the needs of the public who will want to be make sure that 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 artifact continues to exist but at the same time to be able to say that we are going to take the initiative and make those reproductions in advance is also probably to give a few copyright owners uh, a little bit of nervousness and and so they have to be uh, we have to address those issues and respect their the concerns and maybe find a way to say that we can have that that reproduction in advance but we cannot um, maybe we'll get to this in toolkit number two maybe we need to have measured perspective on access so that the broader the 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 right of reproduction maybe it's tempered by other conditions that's how statutes come into existence now i'm i'm not endorsing any particular approach but in fact the the whole idea of the toolkit is to be able to say that 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 there are choices and that the better statutes that serve preservation, that respect the interests of rights holders, and that function appropriately within the context of the institutions, their funding, the needs of the, the local population, all of these kinds of variables that exist and that differ from one country to the next. So the idea of the toolkit, again, is to be able to say and to encourage lawmakers, policymakers, anybody beginning to draft a statute to understand that, A, there are many different variables to consider in a good, strong, meaningful statute, and B, not all of them are appropriate for all countries. No one country will include all of the issues it can't and it shouldn't it's too much the statute would just go on and on and on and it would be ridiculous but the the charts would help you narrow the choice of what's important which issues are important and then the ch this the charts would also allow the the each member state the country the lawmakers of the country to be able to say this issue, this variable about the scope of, for example, the scope of materials that may be copied for preservation purposes, that maybe in my country, that's a significant issue where we might have a different response with respect to different kinds of issues. But then the charts would help the lawmaker be able to see that there are choices of language there as well for how to do that implementation. So that said, I'm gonna pause. I'm gonna say thank you all very much. Thank you for making the time in this, this, this program for me to join you by recording at least and to be able to learn from you. I look forward to your responses and to learning how everybody else in this webinar has contributed to the discussion and how you see the issues and how you can help us do a better job as we move on with implementation of the toolkit. Thank you very much. All right, and we thank Kenny for joining us via video. Um, I do see one more question in the question and answer. 
Um, and it says, what's the progress on the trustworthy digital repositories front? Sarah, I noticed that there was a note saying that Stephen would answer this question, but if that's not the case, then we can talk briefly to it. It's for the panelists. Ah, thank you, Stephen. <laughs> All right, um, so I can start. So, you know, this, this issue of uh, uh, a digital repository um, is something that in fact, uh, UNESCO ha has talked about since the 1970s, this idea of creating a national inventory. Um, and certain countries, uh, for example, in Canada, there was a, a lot of effort made to actually develop a national inventory um, that when we hit the development of, of the digital age in the online world, there was an attempt to actually move it into the online space. But it it, it takes an enormous amount of effort to actually coalesce around um, the this notion of a national inventory being a trusted repository. So now there are conversations uh, among consortia uh, and certainly institutional uh, repositories exist. And to what extent we are going to be able to build out as a community um, these trusted uh, repositories is an ongoing policy um, exercise that uh, I think more and more of us should be joining. And I, I'm just going to leave it at that because uh, I've seen great strides forward and then several steps back. Um, so uh, it's it's a it's a very stay tuned. I'm not going to add to that, uh, Sarah. I'm I'm just looking at the other questions that are starting to arrive. Some quite challenging questions now uh, coming into the chat. Okay, great. Um, one of the questions I see is: um, Is there a timeline for toolkit number two, the access to preserved works? I start. Um, there is a timeline. It's uh, an optimistic timeline because um, as we've we've started work on the access toolkit on toolkit number two, very definitely we have a framework. This time we've been asked by WIPO to work as five authors, which present, as you can imagine, presents its own challenges. So the three authors of the first toolkit are there. We've got two distinguished colleagues who've joined us from Jamaica and South Africa, respect respectively, but having five authors inevitably is more likely to bring delay. But we have made a start. Um, we, um, we're, we're pleased with where we've got to. And what, what we've got so far, I think, is um, an, a framework and an outline, which is um, in draft form circulating amongst the authors. And in certain areas, we have dropped, started to drop text into that outline. So there's going to be some to and fro between ourselves and the Secretariat in WIPO about the topic. And one thing that's really very clear to us is that whilst producing the preservation toolkit was challenging, access is a much more multifaceted and um, varied topic to try to address. So we're at work on it. We were, we're working on it this very week, in fact. Um, but I can't give a projected publication date. I think that would be foolhardy. It won't be this year. I think, David, you've captured it perfectly. I don't think there's anything else I can add at this point. OK, um, there's a, a question. It's a multifaceted question. I'm going to pick one of the questions, which is um, what are the types of IP that can be applied to heritage and can it be protected from commercial exploitation by IP? And here we're talking about copyright. So we really are focused on the copyright <laughs> exception. So I'll, I'll focus it into that. 
I think Kenny talked a little bit about the commercial concerns in drafting statutes, but I'll let you take it from there. And and in in uh, full disclosure, I think the the author of these questions is in fact uh, a PhD candidate that is working with me. <laughs> so um, hi, Nayira. Uh, nice to see that you've joined the session. Um, the the context, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Nayira, of your of your question is very much one uh, that is uh, a layered set of issues between the protection of cultural property from a societal standpoint and from a community standpoint, and then uh, the use and ability to leverage intellectual property uh, as a means of achieving that cultural property, while at the same time, the conflict that we all uh, embody within our institutions in that the whole purpose of preserving intellectual property or rather the collections is to ensure access, is to, is to uh, provide the means by which uh, the public and researchers uh, and scholars uh, can identify what in fact was a, a record, if you're looking at an archival collection or, or what in fact was created um, as an artistic movement or as a, a, a literary text, for example. And so this issue is becoming a dominant issue in those um, jurisdictions where uh, there is a pervasive need to try and protect the heritage of a culture. And that I think is the context uh, for the question. But um, the, 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 the answer to what kinds of intellectual property um, are part and parcel of the consideration is something, you know, when we talk about access, copyright is but one, right, issue. As we're all finding out, as we work, start to work more and more with issues such as traditional knowledge, traditional cultural expressions. There are multiple reasons why access may be limited. Some of them are contractual and some, some of them are intellectual property. And it's a balancing act, really. Um, is it more or less of a balancing act when it comes to preservation? You know, I think the argument was made very early on with preservation that the need to preserve was a dominant need. Um, this is a question that's really about the access toolkit more than anything else, I think. And I just add, it, in uh, I mean, the question that's been raised is really very interesting, but it also the, a question that brings up all the different ways of approaching um, preservation, copying, and permissions to make uh, copies from country to country to country, and which priorities a different country wishes to choose. So, just to give to give one example, um, not-for-profit activities in some legislations will be prioritised, and other legislations will not want to make that distinction. Um, and another example is the question of the public good as opposed to the commercial interests. And in some legislations, um, the public good is seen as almost the primary consideration, uh, whereas in other legislations, there's much more primary focus on the rights of the owners of the copyrights. As authors of a toolkit, what we have to do is to lay out the options which people drafting legislation need to consider and then make choices from. So we don't specify um, that not-for-profit must be treated in a particular way or that the public good must be treated in a particular way or that commercial interest must be treated in a particular way. What we try to do is to make sure that we've covered and reviewed all of the options which legislation legislators um, need to take into account. Sometimes it's quite difficult to suppress our private views and preferences when 
writing the toolkit, but that's what we have to do. We have to keep the toolkit neutral and make sure that what it's doing is offering a range of options and considerations from which legislators can make choices that are best for the conditions in their particular country. Okay, and we have a question about how are decolonial practices integrated into the toolkit? I can start off, I, I guess, the, you know, this, this whole issue of decolonization um, is a really difficult one because this is supposed to be a copyright <laughs> exercise. And uh, so many of the issues with respect to decolonization are in fact uh, cultural and it, it relates to the questions that were asked even uh, by the, uh, the, the person posing these complex questions that we just tried to address. Um, the, the, the issue really is one where uh, the context in which, as David just mentioned, uh, the, 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 you know, if you're going to, if you're going to draft a preservation exception to copyright, then those experts within the institution working with the collection has to take into account their entire context. And so an exception to copyright may not address the needs surrounding uh, the interests and the concerns in, uh, in relation to collections that have a colonial past and that are connected to communities uh, in ways that don't necessarily speak to copyright per se, but may speak to traditional knowledge or traditional cultural expressions or simply cultural interests. Um, so, uh, you know, this is one facet of a complex problem. It isn't panacea uh, in uh, trying to preserve uh, collections and in fact, who has authority to preserve and how. I'd agree with uh, agree with that approach. I'd say that on repatriation of uh, cultural heritage, although there are examples starting to emerge, um, particularly where there's a religious context to the potentially repatriated artifacts, in fact, it's extremely rare for primary cultural heritage items to be moved back to what one might think of as their natural home. This is unfortunate but it's the way that the way that things are museums which have spent money on acquiring materials archives in the same way are especially private institutions are disinclined to allow the ethical considerations to override the financial considerations and so it, it this applies in the cases of countries with a colonial past and it also applies in the balance between wealthy acquiring countries which maybe acquire materials which properly properly belong to a different culture as opposed to less wealthy countries whose culture is being acquired by the wealthier in these sorts of cases whilst repatriation is rare the making of um, of copies can actually provide not the best solution but a help and uh uh, an ethically justified way of addressing the past, of coming to terms with um, what is sometimes kindly called shared heritage, but which actually is about colonialism and decolonial decolonializing uh, collections. So um, the ability to make copies in order to complete collections in countries of origin, for example, is an important part of uh, preservation copying, and it's an important ethical consideration. As I say, in practical terms, as cultural heritage professionals, we are seeing very little in the way of repatriation of primary materials. And consequently, the ability to make copies may sometimes be a good second best. 
And I think that is also one of the key issues with the cross-border collaborations, right, in terms of having disparate collections that have now been taken across different borders and then having, com frankly, conflicting exceptions and then trying to resolve those. So, I mean, Absolutely. the more the more that the more countries that have good preservation exceptions that are more consistent, the easier that collaboration can be. And it can be described in neutral terminology, such as reun reunification of collections. Um, and it also raises for the future. I see that there's a question about AI, which I don't feel competent to talk about, but the possibility of preservation copying in the cloud, so that where several cult cult countries or several cultures share an interest in a particular collection, the idea that they could share that collection via cloud storage um, is one of the intriguing possibilities that we haven't seen happening yet, but which people have talked about as a possible future way of sharing copies. This actually goes back to that initial question on, you know, the trusted repository. The trusted repository doesn't have to sit in one jurisdiction with one institution. Um, and so then it becomes really an access issue, <laughs> uh, a, a really big one. Yeah. Do we want to tackle AI? I, 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 leave, tackle that, AI. I leave that to you, if, if <laughs> Rita. The question is, what is your opinion as to where AI, AI stands as one of the resources as it may part be part of future digital cultural heritage one day? It's a really good question. And I think there's a lot, there's a lot of experimentation right now that's ongoing concerning AI and the use of AI and collections management. Um, the, the way we're sort of internalizing it, at least at my institution at Columbia, is that AI is not a substitution, it's a tool, right? And so if we continue to experiment so that we use it as a tool, to either assist us, enable us in doing the intellectual work that we do, then it is but one means of achieving uh, our, our objectives in our work. But to simply use it as a substitution for a uh, human endeavor, at least right now, it's certainly not sufficiently accurate, nor is it sufficiently inclusive um, in, in order to get there. But there are very interesting uh, experiments that are ongoing at various institutions that um, have AI institutes, for example, where R&D is prevalent with uh, library inventories or catalogs. Uh, for example, that's one I know, mm, excuse me. And uh, I know of one in the, mm, uh, the museum field as well, as well where um, the, they're playing with large language models and the development of alternative texts um, uh, and uh, some emotive reaction to en enable um, those who are, uh, have uh, perceptual di disabilities, who are visually impaired, for example, to try and understand uh, a work of art, but it's a stay tuned. I think, I think, I think that's a good point. And Rena, in terms of the tool and not necessarily the output, because, you know, at least the current guidance from the Copyright Office at the US says, if it's completely AI created, it's not copyrightable. So, uh, you know, to the extent that we're trying to talk about copyright exceptions, that's not even something that is copyrightable at all. So are we, you know, trying to preserve those works? But there is a line where some editing and derivative works and arrangement happens, at which point maybe there is some human creative element. So I think this is a this is a rapidly developing topic. And we can't answer all of the complications of it today. Um, okay, last question, because I know everyone has been here for a while. Thank you for attending and for your 
um, participation. This question is, it may be a bit soon for the second toolkit, but are there plans to provide a framework for a new access to heritage exception? Okay, we, we knew this would happen. We knew that we would get um, questions about a toolkit which we haven't written yet. Um, and we, we welcome the interest and we know that there will be uh, ongoing interest in what we, uh, what we produce on access to heritage. It is intended that uh, people will be able to use the second toolkit uh, to, to uh, derive guidelines which may lead in some legislations to new exceptions and limitations in respect uh, of access. As with the first toolkit, what we will have to do is to lay out options. And some of the options will involve some of the uh, criteria that I've already referred to, such as um, not-for-profit, such as uh, the public good, such as the, the purpose, the, the extent to which a particular country in its legislation wants to give priority to the ability to do, uh, to do research or to put on exhibitions uh, and so on. So we are, we are working on that. The second toolkit will provide a framework which in some legislations could lead to new work on exceptions and limitations for access to cultural heritage. Um, but we're quite a long way, for, as I've indicated, as we both indicated, we're quite a, a long way from finalizing that work on the second toolkit. It's really good to know that people are waiting anxiously for it to appear. We'll do our best to move on it as quickly as we can. We, we just want to enjoy the fact that the preservation toolkit is finally done. <laughs> it took that long. Well, I really would like to thank everyone for attending. I would like to thank IFLA, ICOM, and ICA for uh, sponsoring. And of course, the toolkit authors, Rena, David, and Kenny, for your insight. I hope everyone... Um, takes the opportunity to read and use the toolkit. It is such a useful tool and certainly to reach out if there are questions or opportunities for local or regional events. We are definitely looking to spread the word of the toolkit and to help and assist if we can at, uh, in the implementation because of course it does have some um, statutory language that can be implemented on national levels. So, Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you um, for drafting this toolkit. And we do wait and anticipate the next toolkit on access. And of course we will follow up at that time. And thank you to everyone for attending. Have a great rest of your day.